Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for your patience. Just had a little bit of technical difficulties. Uh, my name is Darren Cando. I work in the Faculty of Kinesiology and Health Studies. Um, I've sort of asked to do this last minute, but hopefully I do a little bit of uh, a service to uh, uh, the original speaker's presentation. This was presented at the International uh, Society conference we had uh, pre previously on Saturday. Um, and so the whole premise is to understand the basics between dietary protein. I'm not here to promote protein supplements. We'll go through a little bit of disclosure on that. This usually generates tons of questions. Um, so I'll try to do my best with that as well. Um, I have to give you a bit of disclosure. Um, because we're talking about protein, which is found in dietary supplements, um, I'm part of an international society group that we like to disclose um, all the resources that we've received. So here's some of my um, intakes, if you will. I have received uh, financial reimbursement, travel, as well as, well as honorariums from certain types of companies that do provide dietary supplements. There isn't one time today I'm gonna to talk about a product. I'm not making any money off a product. I'm talking about habitual dietary uh, intake. But if you have any concerns or questions with that, uh, just let me know. So the purpose is for you specifically, and I apologize because the uh, remote won't allow me to walk around too much. So if you wanna have more birthdays, the whole premise here is I think a lot of times we get bombarded by dietary protein. We're a little skeptical. Um, maybe we're not sure about the potential benefits. I think the media does a really terrible job at scaring us. Just very, uh, no different than uh, vitamin E or vitamin D. You're going to hear a lot about that uh, here in Saskatchewan. But this is for you if you want to have more birthdays. If you don't, you can probably just leave and, and save your time. But that actually was me with hair uh, when I was three. Please work. Okay, so the whole idea of dietary protein, and my guess is the majority of people in here would probably be conscious or a little bit of aware of the benefits of dietary protein. It doesn't necessarily mean um, supplements per se. It's but what we're trying to emphasize through natural food products. Um, sometimes we can be, become very convenient with dietary supplements such as a shake or a booster juice, but we're really trying to emphasize food. What makes protein or the information so confusing is that the media, scientists, kinesiology students even for that matter, we get a hold of some of this information and we just take it to heart. So let's look at the history in Canada specifically around protein. High protein diets will destroy your liver and kidneys. How many have heard that? Okay, a couple people, right? If you eat a lot of protein, any biology people in here, you know it goes through your liver and kidneys. So obviously, it's gonna wreak havoc. High protein diets increase fat mass. People say if you're eating all this protein in the run of a day, potentially increases your body weight, inevitably body uh, composition. Uh, I like this one, high protein diets decrease bone mass. This potentially is true. Um, Health Canada recommends that about four um, cups of coffee or caffeine per day can be considered, but the theory with protein, it's an acidic compound, and so when you take an acid in the body, um, you need a buffer, and the biggest buffer in our bodies is our skeleton because it has calcium, so the theory was if you eat or consume a whole bunch of protein, um, you will lose bone density. And then finally, high protein diets are only for bodybuilders. Who in their right mind would want to consume the same amount of protein as Arnold Schwarzenegger in the 1970s? It's only for bodybuilders, why do we need it? They're all false. All this that you hear, and today I'm not allowed to give you an opinion or my hunch, it's all based on peer refereed science. And for anybody else in the audience, especially the students, you really are not allowed to have an opinion. When you're talking about science, you can only talk about facts. Okay, and if it's not supported or refuted, you can't really talk about it. So we'll get into some of this uh, myth or information shortly. A brief history lesson, where have we come from? Fat free. You guys still probably choose condiments, food products that are considered fat free. The issue that you may or may not know is when they take out fat, what do they put in? Simple white sugar. Kellogg's and Pepsi don't want a smaller package because to the layperson, the consumer, like, no, I like bigger and brighter. So they take out fat, put in sugar, obesity's gone up through the roof. Bread, everybody's favorite. Can't eat bread, can't eat past six o'clock, 
They're bad for you. Carbohydrates are typically bad for you. And we now know that you can have a really healthy lifestyle enjoying all types of carbohydrate-based products and not really lead to any negative health consequences. The caveman diet, is anybody on this here where you just eat meat? That's a big push right now for people with epilepsy, type 2 diabetes, and obesity. A lot of people are just eating meat. Okay, you're not worried about carbohydrates, things like that. Um, and then it gets into a little bit of quackery, not to go against anybody in here on a gluten-free diet, but gluten-free diets were designed for people with celiac disease. But a lot of people choose to go on a gluten-free diet for how they feel. It's less bloating, less energy. Unfortunately, we're seeing symptoms now where you take a healthy human and put them on a gluten-free diet, they start developing symptoms of what? Celiac disease. So you gotta be careful of how much or extreme you go. No dairy, that's ethically, antibiotics, whichever it is. The big one that drives me bananas is detox. The hell does a detox diet mean? If you actually think you have form particles or debris in your bloodstream, you're dead. Can you go to a yoga class and detoxify your blood? Uh, it's actually impossible. You don't sweat out toxins per se. And oh, by the way, if you have two healthy organs called a kidney and a liver right beside it, you're detoxifying naturally 24 hours a day. Detox diets are the number one myth or quackery in sport nutrition society today. They're useless. Just like a cleanse, they actually don't do anything. You can use them from a revamping standpoint, but unless you have some issues with those organs, you're naturally doing it right now. We're all cleansing. We're all detoxifying. Again, this is based on research, not my opinion. So where are we all getting our information? A lot of times this comes into play. This individual up here called Dr. Oz is rated the number one quack, listen, the number one quack in North America. He was taken to Congress because every time he's on a show, he's promoting something typically that's not supported by science. There was one show, he says, if you consume raspberry ketones, raspberries, you're gonna lose massive amounts of body fat. You would have to eat every raspberry in Saskatchewan to notice any effect, probably due to the fiber. So again, phenomenal cardiologist, can't knock the MD prescription, but not qualified to give proper nutrition advice because it's not based on research. A lot of individuals in here who can work out, they may get it from the bro science people. The people at the gym say, hey, go take all this drugs, supplements, Flintstone vitamins. They're like, why? You're like, well, I take it. You might as well take it. Gwyneth Paltrow, big push right now. She's arguing against the Canada Research Chair, who's well known, Tim Caulfield. He had a show on Netflix. It's sad that they're canceling his show and putting this goop, which is what it stands for, about cleanses and creams and things like that. We get and we're influenced by the right. No one is gonna listen to me. Very rare do a lay person listen to scientists. Sometimes you don't care what we have to say. You wanna say, I wanna look like a celebrity. Dr. Oz must know what he's talking about, but yet brought to Congress twice, threatened to be sued, and when you get all of us nerds together, if you say, who's the number one quack in the world? Dr. Oz, but also he has 12 to 15 million people who watch his show every day. Big influence. So let's talk protein, the main reason you're here. What is it? Well, I would imagine most of you guys are consuming dietary protein on a regular basis. As you would know, it's primarily found in seafood, red meat, other types of meat, poultry. Um, dairy products, primarily in Saskatchewan, would be one of your biggest delivery agents. But there's a big push now onto plant-based diets, which are extremely beneficial. I will say plant-based diets give you no advantageous effect when it comes to exercise performance uh, compared to eating a balanced diet consuming meat. So hemp, quinoa, soy, these are all sources of dietary protein. When you collapse all thousand research studies on dietary protein, independent of exercise or with exercise, here's what it says. You can experience an increase in muscle mass. You can potentially increase bone mass. 
and strength and endurance. What that means is when you're around the house shoveling the driveway, some of you guys have already probably had to shovel the driveway, that force that you need to lift the snow away is based on muscle mass. Protein is one of the only three macronutrients, so you've probably heard of fat, protein, and carbohydrates. The only one you ever need to worry about for survival is protein. The other ones can be made from the other types of ingredients. So protein, I think, should be the focal point of all your meals and snacks. It's not carbohydrate and it's not fat. If you focus on protein, we'll talk about some of the health benefits uh, that you can experience. If you get to my age, and if there's people in here older than me, so let's, I guess we'll break it up. You are biologically aging if you're 40 and above in here. So raise your hands if you're over 40. If you're over 40, this is really important for you. For the young students who are like 18, 12, 13, they're so phenomenal, they still benefit, but we're gonna consider biological aging from the age of 40 and above, okay? It decreases something called inflammation. You didn't have to come here to understand the principle of inflammation. When you're 20, 30, exercise till you're blue in the face, eat whatever you want, you never get sore. And then as you get older, all of a sudden it's like, holy cow, I did an exercise session on Monday. Unlike when I was 20, I could go back and exercise the next day. You're like, no, my best friend now is something called Advil. I exercised, I'm so sore. I feel like I need to take Advil or acetaminophen. And then when you talk to your parents and grandparents, they're like, geez, I just don't recover as much anymore. I'm always inflamed. Cold weather, anybody who has arthritis, or symptoms of it, their wrists hurt, their knees hurt. Advil becomes your best friend. Whereas the young students say, I don't know what you're talking about, you're too old, beat it. Okay, don't worry, every day we get out of bed, we're getting it more. So how this basic works, I'm not gonna bore you to death, but if you were to simply, everybody would touch their bicep, which is the top portion of your upper arm, that's basically a muscle. And it's all throughout the rest of the body. But no one really cares in reality how big your biceps are. Of course, everybody works those, but we want to increase muscle mass throughout the body so we can perform activities a daily living more often. When you consider a muscle, muscle synthesis is your friend. We want our muscles to synthesize proteins to make them bigger, stronger, faster. You want to live longer free of disease? Muscle mass is the number one key for that. And unfortunately, the number one reason uh, individuals primarily in Saskatchewan are placed in long-term care facilities has nothing to do with flexibility or cardiovascular. It's the lack of muscle mass and strength. They just can't live freely in an independent home. And it's very sad. It costs the healthcare system millions of dollars. So for a, a fancy word for our muscles growing is called hypertrophy. You just think of a bodybuilder, things like that. We all want an increase in muscle. It might be a little tiny bit, or some of you guys might want a lot. The more muscle mass you have, you immediately decrease the risk of chronic diseases hundredfold. Obesity, cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, blah, blah, blah. The more muscle you have, the better off you will be and live longer free of disease. The only way your muscle will grow is in response to exercise, so before we go any further, protein by itself without exercise will only have a minimal effect. You need the stimulus of exercise to be there, okay? Protein is not magic. You still have to do the work to get the benefits of exercise, so I can't really stress this enough. You can drink and eat all the protein till you're blue in the face. You won't get all these benefits unless you exercise, okay? And actually, no matter what dietary supplement you heard of, you still need to exercise. Do I mean walking, jogging? No. It has to be some form of weight-bearing ex exercise. Your body responds very, very well to something with mechanical strain. So this could be shoveling the driveway, chopping wood. Some of you guys may go into a fitness center. Machine weights, dumbbells, anything like that. It's kind of like weight training, but there's various forms of it. That is the most preferred type of exercise for longevity. And if you don't perform any weight-bearing exercise now and you're a little intimidated, there's alternative forms. You can have rubber tubing. You have soup cans at home. It doesn't have to be a lot. You just need to choose something that sort of stimulates your muscles to be engaged. So for the muscle to grow, 
you need dietary protein. I can't stress this enough, the protein will only recover quickly and grow in response to physical activity in the presence of protein. If you do not eat protein within 24 hours after exercise, you become more negative. You've actually wasted all the benefits of exercise. So this is something I really can't stress enough. Why is this so important? Well, here we get into the fun and games. So again, there's individuals in here that are younger than the age of 40. And this is them, right? Of course, everybody now, we hate them, right? They're so young and precious. They have phenomenal body. Uh, what this is showing, this is an MRI scan. If I put my leg in the magnet and it's sort of chopping it off, okay? So the bright white cylinder is the femur bone. It's insanely strong. It's basically as strong as the concrete wall. Very rare do you break the femur. It's usually a sporting event or a car accident or something very traumatic. It's near impossible to break this bone. What's the yellow around the bone? What would it be? It's the precious muscle. Okay? It's kind of erratic. It's not uniform. And then getting ready for, what are we, minus 45 today? It started before Halloween. We got seven months of winter. What are we famous for in this province? What's the red around the muscle? Fat. So pinch your body, you feel subcutaneous fat. This is in a young, healthy individual, okay? This is what happens when you age. If you're not convinced to move and move more often, this is like the gold standard. We show this around the world. You take the same individual 35 years later, what happened to the bone? Now I could probably take your femur and crack it over my knee. This is the strongest bone in the body. Imagine if this was the wrist or ankle. Some of you guys have also fallen already. A young individual can bounce back up. Aging individual might fall and say, oh my God, I fractured my ankle. God forbid, I fractured my hip. Okay? And this is usually a negative portion of the talk. What happens to the muscle? You go through a process called atrophy. This is why you can't play tackle football when you're 90. This is why you can't recover as much. Why Advil becomes your friend. You actually have less muscles called sarcopenia. And lo and behold, we become more flavorful. The muscle shrinks. Metabolism goes down, and what goes up? Body fat. Is this a good thing? No. However, if you're needing some motivation to exercise, if you start today and you maintain exercise two to three days a week till the day you die, you look just like this. It's not a technical glitch. If you exercise independent of nutrition, your muscle will resemble just like that when you're 100 years of age. Inactivity, also known as the Canadian population, you look like that. And oh, by the way, sedentary students look like the picture on the right. Aging will get you, but my God, inactivity gets you really quickly. You need to move and move more often. I can't stress this enough. There's no drug, supplement, pill, or powder that has the power of exercise. There's a big push that exercise is medicine. I argue against it. I said exercise is beyond medicine. Medicine will target one small thing. For those who exercise in here, you get this massive endorphin release, things we can't explain. You feel better about yourself, improvements to the body, and as little as two sessions a week, you can resemble a healthy muscle. Doesn't take a lot, but everybody's like, I got no time. I got four hours of Netflix tonight, I'm on my iPhone six hours a day, I gotta eat, I gotta go to class, I got no time. You do have time. If you don't have an MRI, you can just go to a grocery store. This is the students in here, again, we're mad at them right now because their muscles look like a tenderloin steak. You go to Chop, Diplomat, whichever it is, they're usually one of the most expensive steaks. Why? Because their muscles actually look like that. Go to a grocery store. That's exactly what it looks like. 
hardly any subcutaneous fat. They have a lot of muscle. If you go to my age, you become like a cheap fast fry steak, right? You go to Sobeys tonight, you're looking in the meat section, you're like, oh, too expensive. Look at all that muscle. And then you're like, let's go over and see Darren's head on the steak. And there it is. Why am I cheap? Way more fat tissue because I was inactive. And then you add in all this white marbling effect. My dad says, don't cut it off on the barbecue. It's more flavorful. We're going to uh, pr pretend that doesn't exist. But if you were to take away and chop away all this white, which is fat and connective tissue, you're left with a little morsel of muscle. You don't want to be the right fast fry steak. You want to maintain the integrity on the left. And if it's not going to happen to you, well, if it happens to the best genetic bodybuilder ever on the planet, the aging process will get everybody. And the aging process happens every day you wake up. You're a day older. You are never too old or late to start exercising. We have centurions in Italy who have started at the age of 100, and the percent increase in muscle mass and strength is through the roof. Don't ever let someone say you're too old to start. And by the way, you're never too young to start. I won't talk about the benefits of exercise for children. There's a lot of myths with that. I can stand for nine hours. But you are never too old to start. Maintain movement of physical activity. What you enjoy is very beneficial. Poor Arnold, open heart surgery, took anabolic steroids. When you see him here in the 1970s, Mr. Olympia, you would say, he never needs to worry about body fat accumulation, never needs to worry about muscle loss. But over there, you can see the biological process of aging. I think every time we look in the mirror, we can say, geez, the aging process is really accelerated. So it's going to happen to everybody. Unfortunately, one of the main mechanisms what happens to our body after the age of 50 or 40 and really accelerates at the age of 50 is we go through something called anabolic resistance. And this is a really important um, phenomenon that sort of blossomed in the last decade. If I work out and Garrett works out, we do the same program. I have a blunted response to exercise. So this is important to pay attention to. If I go into work out and do the same program as someone younger, that person seems to have a much more positive response to exercise. Through the process of anabolic resistance, which is a whole cascade of biological processes, in bottom terms, the person who's 40 in here needs to do double the amount of work just to get the same effect as someone younger. The body is going through processes that require more exercise volume. So if you're familiar with exercise sets or the amount of time you're working out, unfortunately, we have a blunted response to exercise. And the only way that I think the aging individuals in this audience can overcome this and become a, a youthful type of muscle is to exercise a little bit more. Not a lot more, just a little bit more. So if a student exercises for 45 minutes, the aging body needs to do about 60 minutes or even 75 minutes to get the same effect. And man, people like me should be fired. Because for decades, what do we tell aging individuals? You're getting older, so you don't need to do much. We've lied. When you get older, you actually need to flip it and do a little bit more. OK? I wish I could use this thing, but it'll screw up all those. And if you have questions with this, we can talk about it after. So this freaked me out. I got my wife to do this. So this is when I'm younger on the left. And then I'm 13 with the baseball glove. That's as big as me. And like my forearms are bigger than my biceps, a bit weird. Then graduating high school, and then the one that second last was a recent picture a couple years ago. And then on these new phones, you can do this aging app. And so it looks just like my grandfather, which is a little freaking me out. I thought there was going to be hair miraculously coming on, but that didn't happen either. But I did have hair once, which is kind of interesting. You would look at these pictures and say, oh, when I'm growing, I need the most protein. Super active, low body fat, no debt. No stress, go on. And then you're like, as you get older, well, you don't do much. You know, your grandfather, he might go to Tim Hortons, walk around the house, yell at me for doing something bad. 
And who did we, or ironically, I would have speculated till about the last decade that from me in high school all the way left, I require a lot more protein because I'm growing and developing. And man, oh man, did we ever get it wrong. It's the farthest one on the right that requires the most protein. If you are over the age of 50, your task immediately is to focus on type of protein that's on your plate for supper. And I'm gonna give you easy examples, and you're probably consuming it now, you just didn't know about what are some of the sources or products. But God, we got it wrong, because obviously as I get older, I've already achieved the most muscle I'll ever have. And therefore, when you get older or start aging, you start to deteriorate over time. So at best, I'm gonna maintain what I have. Unfortunately, here's another negative stat. You actually almost lose 1% of your muscle per year. So what if you start out with hardly any? You're gonna be in a wheelchair, using assistive devices. If you can build it up as much as possible at a younger age, it's gonna be so beneficial. And God, it's never too late to start. If you're not sure how to exercise, we offer free services up in the FLC. I'm more than happy to answer any of the questions. If you need to pay for a personal trainer, I think it's the best investment you can use. Not in cannabis stocks and all that crap, it's exercise. Exercise prevents a force field around your body that you just can't put a price on. Muscle mass goes down, carrying groceries gets harder. Shoveling the driveway gets harder. You become inactive. Accelerated death, so to speak. I love this diagram because if you, we can't put exercise in a pill, but man, if you could ever put the symptoms of exercise into resistance training or weight bearing exercise, so this could be aqua size, shoveling the driveway, little dumbbells, tubing, whichever it is. Anything that you say, oh, that felt a little stressful, is extremely beneficial. Cardiovascular exercise is phenomenally good for you, but it has no, better, no comparison to the multifactorial benefits of resistance training. If you had to choose one thing, there's clear evidence resistance training is the best modality. Okay, so if you're not sure how to do this, just talk to a trained professional. Increase in longevity, cardiovascular disease, everything comes down. Um, you get an increase in sports uh, performance, obviously for the athletes. Um, so a long way of life is prescribed. But protein, don't worry about the top, protein is just the icing on the cake. So we talk about the beneficial effects of protein, and I will say it's a little bit of icing, maybe the sprinkles. You still need the cupcake or cake to be there. I can't stress enough, if you take one thing away today, is that protein is really good for you, but exercise is crucial. I need you to understand that exercise is crucial. You've been lied to by the government, not just Trudeau who got back in, but we're talking about the FDA, Food and Drug Agency, and Health Canada. And as you would speculate, they're really quick to take our money in income tax, but man, from a policy perspective, they took 10 years to change Canada's food guide, and they still got it wrong. And here's what they're saying. That the amount of protein you need to consume on a run of a day is 0.8 grams per kilogram. So I know most people don't know their weight in kilograms, but hypothetically, let's say if you were 70 kilograms, about 155 pounds. That's 56 grams of protein, not per meal, the government is saying per day. And then we look at all that dosages at 0.8 grams per day, and if you consume only that, you suffer bone loss, you suffer muscle mass, you increase the rate of caxia, certain types of cancers, you decrease muscle strength, performance, so on and so forth. They're considering this from a global perspective that 98%, so if I took 98% of the people in here and put you on 0.8 grams of protein per day, I would be doing a severe disservice to you. There's over 500 peer refereed articles using isotopic tracers where we inject things in the body showing that if you consume this amount, it's not enough. The problem with protein is so expensive. Go to Costco and buy salmon and all that, it's super expensive. So it's really difficult to get the amount. It's 100% false. This is not correct. If you know any dietitians 
or some in here, they're trained to say 0.8 grams. I hope they're a little bit more educated on research because by the time a policy changes, just like at the U of R, be dead by sometimes policy changes, or governmental policies, it could be so outdated. And this is substantially outdated. It's not my opinion, remember, I'm basing this on all the science. If you remember from Saturday Night Live, especially today, you need a fever and it's not for cowbell, you need more protein. Okay, I need you to start realizing when you're making supper, lunch, breakfast, snack, protein is, should be the focal point. Immune system, and especially where it's getting cold out, your immune system relies heavily on protein. If you don't want to get sick, increase protein. There's certain cells in the immune system that really rely on amino acids. So this is a fancy, boring, boring, boring chart. And I just want to show you or highlight it. I was lucky enough to be part of this. This is a meta-analysis where a bunch of nerds get together and they take all these si or, uh, studies, and I think it was touted at over $65 million in studies here on the left. And what it showed was if you consume protein in addition to resistance training, this might shock you, you should only expect about two pound greater increase in muscle mass. $65 million across the world and they could only say if you consume protein with resistance training compared to people who said I don't care about protein I'm just going to work out, you get about another two pounds of muscle. To the young person they're like that's nothing. To the aging person going through sarcopenia that could be the difference between living free in your home and being placed in a long term care facility. Exercise is your number one focal point. Protein will give you a small, greater effect. And of course, you might have questions like, what type of protein? Doesn't matter when I eat it. So if you've seen this, don't answer, but here's your little quiz. You didn't know there was a quiz today, right? Midterm week. How much protein should you ingest per day if you want to be active, healthy, and exercise? There's the 0.8 grams, right? Liberals got in, probably not going to change it. What do you think? How many people think 0 0.8 to 1.0? Anybody? What about all the way down to greater than 2.2 grams? That's about a gram per pound. You're like, wait a minute, the government said I only need a 56 grams if I'm 70 kilograms. Now you want me to take 150 grams? How am I going to afford that? My kidneys are going to explode. Where'd you hear that? Well, it was in the news. If you guessed, approximation of this, we'll get you the answer in a second. This just came out. So I'm really happy that the timing of this presentation came in about. So the most comprehensive analysis of all the studies around the world looked at age, uh, training, sex, when they collapsed all the data to come up with the optimal dosage for you, there's like 40 people in here, the optimal dosage for you to consume starting at supper is nowhere near 0 0.8 grams per kilogram. You wouldn't even give that enough to your dog. When they looked at all the data, here's what your first take home is. You have the luxury of consuming 1.2 grams all the way up to 2.2 depending on your activity. You fall in the middle. Scientists, the best in the world, have now recommended and concluded that 1.2 grams per kilogram, so 70 times 1.2, is the minimum amount you should be consuming. The minimum. The median is 1.6. And if for those that live in Saskatchewan, we don't live in Florida where it's nice out. You got to go through hell seven months of the year. You're exercising now because I'm making you. It's okay to be around 2.2 grams per kilogram. I'll flip that. That's equivalent to a gram per pound. If you're an exercising individual in here, if you're aging, if you have any history of disease, one gram per pound is the maximal amount you need to work on. 
and you're like, oh my God, I'm 190 pounds. It's not that difficult to get 190 grams of protein in a day. But issues of finances, myths, personal preference. So I'm just giving you the information, it's how you take it. And again, this is not my opinion. I take way more than this. This is science, and I can send you all, every article you want until you're blue in the face. I'll overload the PDF system, okay? But that's where you gotta get your information. Is 0 0.8 even in this range? Not even close. The government should be fired. Because they're telling everybody, eat this, and then do you notice when we give them advice, every chronic disease on the planet has done what? It's gone up. Type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, Obesity, blah, 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 blah. Now this is interesting. How much time do I have? Okay, a little bit. How much protein should you ingest per meal if you're under the age of 40? So this is interesting because you might be cooking tonight for your family and some individuals are less than 40. Remember, if you're over 40, you have that blunting response. And luckily, if you're under 40, you're so sensitive, you're cocky, you're like, hey, I'm way better than you. Sadly, per meal, yes, you are. What's the best dosage here? For those that are under the age of 40, it is interesting. They have a phenomenal extra ability to eat more often. So if you're under the age of 40, to maximize muscle protein synthesis and the response, you don't need a lot. 0.25 grams per kilogram, so if you're 70 kilograms, geez, that's a tall glass of milk. You don't need a massive steak dinner. If you're under the age of 40, you only need about 20 to 30 grams of protein per serving to maximize the health benefits. If you take more, that's fine, but if you take less, you're jeopardizing your ability to recover. And I think this is way less than what a lot of people thought. Sadly though, for those who are over the age of 40, what's the dosage? And they use tracers again in the body. They're kind of like radioactive, but they're not. What's the dosage for those in here over the age of 40? So this is important when you go home to eat tonight. You're like, holy God, I wasn't eating nearly enough protein. And then you start doing this and you're like, I don't get sick, I don't get the flu. I recover better, I can exercise more. I hate to tell you this, it's terrible as well, but 0.4 grams. Now it's not a lot, if you're 70 kilograms, that's only about 28 grams, but it is more than a young body. And this just goes to show we've told lies for decades, saying as you get older you need less, you actually need more. 0.4 gram per kilogram meal in an aging body is identical to 0.25 in a younger body. And it's pretty basic math. If you say, I want to ingest 1.6 grams, well, if you're an older individual, it's four meals a day. If you're a younger individual, you could do it in four meals, you might need a little bit more. But this is how you can actually take nutrition and use it to your, because everybody's different weight. You gotta go on a scale, how, find how much you weigh, and now you can tailor your meal uh, uh, frequency or ingestion over time. Is the timing important? Drives me bananas. You go to a gym, and people, or even in the hallway, they're doing this. You see this, right? Everybody's out in society, and they're like cocktail, and oh, geez, you're flipping it around. And I'm like, what's in there? Oh, it's protein, I gotta have it, because if I don't drink it, right after I work out, I will die. I'm like, wait a minute. You probably won't die, or they're like, no, I'm gonna deflate. I'm like, no. So you go to any fitness center, and in the change room, they're just barely got their clothes off and they got this cocktail going 24 seven. They just jam it into their body. And when you ask the people why, and they're like, well, I don't really know, but some, someone said it's good to me. If we're that strict, we might as well just pack it up and finish it off right now, okay? When do you think is the best time to consume protein in regards to muscle growth and recovery? I would have said for sure it's right after exercise, because why? You see everybody with this shaker cup, right? I gotta get my protein in. 
before exercise, during. A lot of times you see this now, people are drinking this magic cocktail during the exercise session, or it doesn't matter. Well, interestingly enough, when you collapse all the studies that have looked at timing, when you have adequate protein in your diet, when you have an adequate amount, the timing is completely irrelevant. This is an important thing, especially if you have children who say, I got to eat as soon as possible or I'm going to die. That's not true. When you have an adequate amount, which we've talked about, the timing is actually irrelevant. It doesn't matter. I will argue to I'm blue in the face with people. They just don't believe it. You, who knew that you could actually finish your exercise session, go home, enjoy a nice meal, and still respond the exact same way as slamming in some gross concoction in the change room? It's convenient, but God, it's kind of nice to go home and prepare real food, which we're trying to promote. I don't want to be a hypocrite, but all that effort you do walking, playing golf, jogging, whichever it is, I think eating right after exercise or shortly after is a great way to reward yourself. So I think it's an ideal time to refuel the body. Because I don't want you to take away or leave from here and say, I'm only working out one day a year. <laughs> if that's true, this doesn't apply to you. But if you're like, hey, I want to work out Monday, why? I don't care if you want to gain muscle mass or whichever. If you say, I feel great, well, I'd like you to go back Tuesday. And by consuming protein between days, you're going to recover the muscles quicker, and that might allow you to maintain a continuous program. This is brand new, and I know it's, you're not going to like it. Because are you saying, Darren, that you can eat past six? Yes, I am. But you need to really pay attention to what I'm saying. So this is the newest area of research from the Netherlands. And this is right before you put your pajamas on. Remember we talked about the maximal daily amount, and you're like, geez, that's going to be tough for me to get this much protein per day. I kind of don't have time for breakfast. I might have a little bit for lunch. But what they're seeing is if you consume protein right before bed, about 30 to 40 grams of dairy, milk, or yogurt, when you're sleeping, it seems to recover your muscles quite substantially. In other words, athletes are using this premise quite often now. I tried it. I couldn't get to sleep. Because I was basically this much protein is found in a, a pretty good bowl of Greek yogurt. I just found it for me too heavy. I tried it with milk, same thing. So it's really trial and error. If you can eat right before bed, it's a really, really effective way to recover the muscle. But some people say, I tried it, it just wasn't for me. And that's fine. It's just giving you another alternative or strategy to get your daily amount. But if you say, hey, I'm hungry at night, and now all of a sudden you become an exercising individual, or you say, we're going to go and exercise tomorrow, it's a really effective strategy. Okay. So it's just a way that you say, I ate supper at five. Is it okay to have a snack? I'm like, yes, but remember, this is protein. This is not like Pop-Tarts and a big plate of pasta and things like that. It's a very controlled amount of protein. And they've only ever used dairy, yogurt, or milk. So Santa Claus is probably getting ready for all this as we get going. Very interesting one. I want to do a study here at the U of R in young individuals with another ingredient. Um, to see if it can have the same effect. Does the type of protein matter? So this is a huge area of interest. Obviously, plant-based diets, some people in here might be vegetarians, pescatarians. Again, everybody has a different opinion. I think if you get your total daily amount, the source doesn't matter. But the one little compound, if you will, that does matter is something called leucine. So to make a protein, you need 20 of these little Lego blocks called amino acids. And they're all important. But the most important is leucine. It's like the spark plug of your car. And this one little Lego or, or building block sort of stimulates the process of recovery. And thank God, it's actually found in all complete protein sources. Salmon, other types of seafood, meat. But it is found in abundance in soy, hemp, or other vegetable type of proteins. 
You just need to be educated on which ones. So it's crucial to understand the beneficial effect, but I think, you know what, if you pay attention to the total daily amount, if you say 1.2 grams, 1.6, all the way up to 2.2, you never need to worry about the leucine content. You, you'll hear some athletes talk about it, but if you're getting that much protein, obviously you're probably gonna get enough leucine, but that's something to be paying attention to, especially for the vegetarians in here, or individuals who don't consume animal products. It's very uh, important to, to, to focus on the amount of leucine. You want about 15 grams a day. And it's highly involved in dairy and or meat. Skip this. Um, of all food products on the planet, the highest concentration is found in bovine milk. And you also get this other important type of protein called casein. So you know those commercials you saw with regarding exercise for chocolate milk? There's evidence behind it because milk is one of the most effective recovery agents that the human body can take. All this nonsense I'm giving you, if you want to put it in simple terms and you consume dairy products, a tall glass of milk is probably all you need after a workout. It doesn't matter what it is. You get protein, you get other vitamins and minerals, and it has a high concentration of leucine and other types of proteins. If you don't like milk, you consume yogurt, great. Of course, obviously, this is found in steak, seafood, or for people who are lactose intolerant or vegetarian, you may have a big jug of this type of protein on your counter. It would probably be a complete protein as well. Email me if you have any questions with the type, source, or if you're thinking of buying something, um, because you don't need supplements. You can get all this naturally through your diet. But can you go and eat all that in one meal? the worst thing you could ever do to the human body is miss food. And don't ever miss breakfast. Just not because it's the most important meal of the day, every meal is, when you consume food, you stimulate your metabolism. I need you to think of you guys out at Regina Beach. You build a fire, that encompasses wood. That's called food. You light it, just like what happens when you eat, it burns bright. When it burns bright, you give off heat, no different than what you're doing right now. What happens two hours later at the beach if you don't put more wood in? The fire goes out, your metabolism goes out, and actually you store body fat. If you skip breakfast, you're just putting yourself at a really hindrance to maintaining optimal body composition. And what should be the focal point at breakfast? Just like it should be the focal point at lunch, dinner, post-exercise, and before sleep, it's protein, okay? You will optimize your efficiency or absorption. You don't want a lot of it going down the toilet. If you went and ate that from Las Vegas, well, there's a lot of things that would happen and you may not actually still be here afterwards. It'd be crazy to say, let's just go and eat our whole daily amount of protein in one meal. No, your body can only absorb so much. So there's a, a theory called protein pacing. And I think a lot of individuals in here probably do this. You want to eat the dosage of protein I've talked about, 0.25 grams for a young individual or 0.4, multiple times throughout the day, so you absorb all that protein, less is being excreted down the toilet. And so you can easily do this in three to five small meals a day. <coughs> Breakfast, lunch, dinner, and potentially a little bit more. So instead of one glass of milk and a chicken sandwich, which is 56 grams of protein, that the government used to say was beneficial for healthy aging, uh, we know you need substantially more. Doesn't have to be this, obviously. You can have an enjoyment of food. If that doesn't get your total daily amount, you may want to throw in a smoothie, chocolate milk, any type of snack after exercise. And then if still that doesn't do it, something before bed. So for me, I like to eat about five or six times a day. This is easy for me, but other people on their schedule say, I can only eat two, two and a half times a day. Keep in mind, you're gonna to have to take a lot more in throughout the day as well. So here's your best summary. This collapses all thousand research studies. For those under the age of 40, you're trying to look at about 0.25 grams per kilogram per meal, or roughly 20 to 30 pounds, or grams. Over the age of 40, you need a bit more. 
three to five servings a day, breakfast, lunch, all the way down. You want to emphasize food. And if supplements are just an easy way or convenient way for you to get the total daily amount of protein, that's fine. Boost, booster juice, anything like that is beneficial. And since we're in Canada, I usually recommend a gram per pound for those who exercise on a regular basis. Go in the privacy of your own home, go on the scale, do the math. The minimal amount is going to be about 0.7 grams per pound, okay, or 1.2 in kilograms. Way more than what you probably heard of. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just giving you all the information based on research. And if you want this presentation, I can easily uh, email it to you. So here's your take home points. The amount of protein per serving is important, but obviously the total daily amount is superior. That's what I want you to focus on starting today. The source, frequency, timing, and pre-sleep are all adjuncts or ways to get the total daily amount. So if it's a little bit too difficult to start today, start first thing tomorrow. And as a side, the more protein you eat, the more body fat you lose. Protein is the only food that stimulates a metabolic fire in the body. Carbohydrates and fat don't. You want to lose body fat? That amount of protein will help do it. The cool thing is you're not hungry ever. For those who eat this much protein, you're not craving simple sugars, bad calories. Halloween tomorrow night, I should be giving out many protein bars, but it's not the point, right? <laughs> there is my uh, social media nonsense. Email is probably the most important. Um, I thank you for your time. Hopefully you learned a little bit of information. The key is the total daily amount. If you have any questions, I think we have a little bit of time to answer. And if not, please email me about anything related to uh, uh, the presentation. I'd be more than happy to give it to you as well. Um, so thank you for your time. I know there was a little bit of difficulty, but I, we do have a couple minutes if you have any questions.